Welcome everybody to a discussion on facilitating progress in the treatment of small cell lung cancer. This is exciting. You know, 10 years ago, trying to talk about treatment uh, progress in small cell lung cancer would have been a dramatically different discussion. Even five years ago was a different discussion. And so I'm excited to be joined by uh, Dr. Leo and Dr. Awani Koko. Um, we'll start out uh, with uh, a discussion on some of the diagnostics of small cell, then first line therapy, second line and beyond and then get a bit into looking ahead in the field and some of the progress that's happening now. For the objectives for today, I will read this, but uh, beyond that, then we'll, we'll get into it. So we're gonna analyze the role and the use of current and emerging therapies for small cell lung cancer and the evidence supporting their use. Improve your skills in developing individualized treatment plans for patients with small cell lung cancer throughout the disease continuum, using the latest evidence and recommendations, as well as recommend clinical trial participation to more patients with small cell lung cancer based on improved awareness of the latest trials with current and new emerging therapies. And with that, I will invite Dr. Leo to kick us off. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sand. So we'll talk about our new and emerging therapies, but starting off with optimism here and some hope for our patients with small cell lung cancer, because we now have, over the last few years, seen results of clinical trials demonstrating now new therapies for our patients. In the front line, we now have approval of two agents, Dervalumab with chemotherapy as well as atezolizumab with chemotherapy. In the second line, we now have approval of lurbanectidin. But we know that we need to continue to make continued improvements and build upon some of these successes. And certainly, there are barriers to treatment advances in small cell lung cancer. Our patient population with small cell lung cancer uh, certainly is a population with comorbidities and challenges due to smoking-related uh, you know, comorbidities. And one of the things that we continually try to work on is better supportive care and how do we optimize patients so that they are eligible to benefit from these approved therapies. In addition, our clinical trials really do need to meet the needs of our patients. And another sort of big effort is how do we bring clinical trials to patients and certainly improve eligibility in a way that represents our patient population and also enrolls minority populations so that we can then um, really uh, use these therapies in a way that benefits all of our patients. Lastly, you know, certainly issues with tissue acquisition remains a big challenge, and so we do have to improve the biomarker piece, too, in terms of selecting patients most likely to benefit from therapies. So certainly we've had lots of efforts in small cell lung cancer, lots of failed randomized trials, some successes, um, and particularly we need to continue to work on the building onto what success we have so far, especially in second line and beyond. So let's talk a little bit about that. How can we accelerate progress and where we are now and where we're going? So we'll start with a case. So this is a 65-year-old male with past medical history of hypertension, COPD, and hyperlipidemia with a 45-pack year smoking history who presents with cough, generalized fatigue for three months, good performance status. Initial imaging demonstrates a left upper lobe opacity, and then follow-up CT scan of the chest demonstrates a four-centimeter left upper lobe mass with left hilar and mediastinal adenopathy. Blood work demonstrates anemia with a hemoglobin of 8.4 and thrombocytopenia with a platelet of 67,000. Additional workup included a bronchoscopy with biopsy that revealed a diagnosis of small cell lung cancer. Staging revealed negative brain MRI, and the PET-CT demonstrated the diagnosis of extensive stage disease with multiple hepatic lesions, bone marrow involvement with skeletal metastasis. He now presents to our clinic to discuss further management. So let's talk about the data, and I'll review uh, briefly first-line therapy. I know a lot of this is data that now is old news, but let's talk a little bit about it in the context of our patient that we will talk about in our case discussion. So we have the approval now of atezolizumab in combination with chemotherapy based on the Empower 133 study. This was a randomized phase three study that included patients with untreated extensive stage small cell lung cancer, Patients with treated asymptomatic brain mets were eligible and randomized one-to-one -to, -one to the combination of atezolizumab, a PDL1 inhibitor with platinum atoposide for four cycles, followed by maintenance atezolizumab 
and in the control arm, patients receive placebo, followed by placebo maintenance. The co-primary endpoints here are overall survival and investigator assessed progression-free survival. Thoracic radiation was not permitted, and PCI was per local standard of care. And here are the results of the MPAR-133, now with further follow-up, with a median follow-up of 22.9 months, demonstrating sustained benefit with 18-month overall survival rate in the Atezo plus chemo arm of 34% versus 21%. Here, the hazard ratio for overall survival, 0.76. We've also seen the results of the Caspian study investigating Dervalimab, another PDL1 inhibitor in combination with chemotherapy here, three-arm study, also including patients with untreated extensive stage small cell lung cancer. In this study, patients with asymptomatic or treated and stable brain mets were permitted. Patients who were randomized to the combination of DERVA plus chemotherapy for four cycles followed by DERVA maintenance. The control arm was um, platinum etoposide, which in the Caspian study allowed either cisplatin or carboplatin, followed by optional PCI and observation. And then here we also saw the arm of Derva plus Tremi plus CP, followed by Dervalumab. We'll focus mainly on the Derva plus CP arm. The primary endpoint here is overall survival. And we've seen now the longest follow-up in a clinical trial for extensive stage small cell lung cancer investigating immunotherapy, showing here that tail of the curve that we are accustomed to seeing in other immunotherapy studies with a three-year overall survival for patients with Derva plus CP now 17.6% versus 6.8%, really demonstrating the benefit of adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy with a hazard ratio here of 0.71. So here's where we're at currently, first-line chemoimmunotherapy as a standard of care. We've had two other studies um, demonstrating also benefits with immunotherapy with Keynote 604, with pembrolizumab, EA5161, with nivolumab, really demonstrating that there is an added benefit to using immunotherapy for these patients. The tremolumumab uh, arm in the Caspian study did not meet the primary endpoint of overall survival, and this has not led to approval of this combination in the frontline setting. But we do have an updated study that was presented at ASCO 2022. Surplulimab is a PDL1 inhibitor that was investigated in a study that was a global study and has led to the approval of this PDL1 inhibitor in China. Similar study design here, including patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer. Patients were randomized two to one to the combination of surplulimab plus carboatope, followed by maintenance. And then in the control arm, placebo in combination with chemo, followed by maintenance with primary endpoints of overall survival. And I think what really stood out here was sort of the median overall survival here in this study is actually the highest that we've seen in these frontline studies. The median overall survival with the combination here is 15.4 months versus 10.9 months in the placebo. And we're seeing here the hazard ratio 0.63. This agent is not approved in the US, but is approved in China. We've also added additional immunotherapy agents to this combination backbone of Atezo plus chemotherapy in this effort in the Skyscraper 2 study, investigating the addition of tergolimab, an anti-tigit monoclonal antibody in patients with previously untreated extensive stage small cell lung cancer. And in this study, patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to the combination of tergolimab plus Atezo plus chemotherapy, followed by maintenance of the combination versus placebo plus atezo plus chemotherapy, followed by placebo plus atezo maintenance. The primary endpoints here were co-primary endpoints of overall survival and investigator assessed progression-free survival in the primary set analysis set, which was defined as all randomized patients without presence or history of brain mets at baseline. And this study has resulted and has been presented at ASCO 2022, demonstrating here that the addition of tergolimab to the backbone of chemoimmunotherapy did not lead to improvement in progression-free survival or overall survival. So this combination with tergolimab is not moving forward in small cell lung cancer. However, uh, there remains sort of hope in efforts to really look at anti-tigit in small cell lung cancer with this 
randomized phase three study investigating another anti-tigit antibody. This is vibostolumab in combination with pembrolizumab and chemotherapy with patient, in patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer. This study is ongoing um, and is continuing to accrue, and we'll wait to see what the results are to really answer the question of whether there is any role for anti-tigit in small cell lung cancer. So let's move on to the question of trilocyclib. Um, trilocyclib is an agent that has been approved for chemotherapy-induced myelosuppression. And really, this approval by the FDA came from a pooled analysis of three randomized phase two studies of trilocyclib, as outlined here, demonstrating that the use of trilocyclib led to um, myeloprotection um, and also led to decrease in uh, supportive care efforts for patients, as well as some quality of life endpoints. The pooled analysis included two, uh, three randomized phase two studies, including in the front line with the combination of carboplatin metoposide atezolizumab with trilocyclib, another study with the combination of carboplatin metoposide and trilocyclib, and then the third study in the previously treated setting, combining trilocyclib here with topotecan. Of note, in these studies, patients that were included in the trilocyclib studies all had adequate organ function at study entry. And the primary endpoints of the pooled analysis included the duration of severe or grade four neutropenia, defined as ANC less than 500, as well as occurrence of severe neutropenia during cycle one. Both endpoints met statistical significance, as you can see here, where the blue is the bar that includes trilocyclib given prior to chemotherapy, and then orange is placebo. In addition, the majority of the secondary endpoints also favored trilocyclib, including GCSF administration that met statistical significance. We're also seeing numerical a decrease here in grade three, four anemia, red blood cell transfusion on or after week five, ESA administration, and also seeing here the grade three or four thrombocytopenia really favoring the use of trilocyclib in patients in this pooled analysis. And this led to FDA approval of this agent for patients using chemotherapy in uh, small cell lung cancer. In addition, they also demonstrated here in terms of quality of life, uh, improvement in patients in several domains with the combination of trilocyclib with chemotherapy, including improvements in physical well-being, functional well-being, and fatigue, as well as anemia, independent of um, needing blood transfusions for the fatigue. They also looked at endpoints of PFS or OS, um, and here to summarize what it really demonstrated it was that the addition of trilocyclib did not have any detrimental effects in the outcomes for patients with small cell lung cancer. In terms of adverse events and tolerability of this agent in combination with chemotherapy, um, this agent has been well tolerated and there have not been any safety signals with the addition of trilocyclib to chemotherapy. We're seeing here that one of the most common side effects are injection site reactions. The majority of these are low grade. There were no grade three or four adverse events. Phlebitis occurs in 8% of patients. Acute hypersensitivity in 6% of patients. Again, no grade three or four. VT in 3% and alopecia in 13% and 25% in standard of care patients. So now continuing with this case though, um, let's see, before we continue with this case, let's discuss it a little bit. We have a little bit of time. So um, first of all, one thing we didn't discuss before we did talk a little about this, um, a patient that comes in uh, with no smoking history, would you do genomic testing in those cases? So for a patient that is um, new diagnosis of small cell lung cancer, um, that is a never smoker, you know, I definitely would do genomic testing. I would also kind of consider whether this pac patient has a mixed histology, or perhaps this is a patient with EGFR transformation with small cell. That's something that certainly can happen even in these uh, patients with de novo diagnosis of small cell. So I do think genomically it would be really important to investigate this further. Yeah, so rare scenario. Go ahead. Yeah, I do agree as well. I think in situations like that where one is not sure, but I think the first thing is to actually make sure that the patient is a never smoker uh, because I've had, you know, instances where for other reasons, someone might not be willing to volunteer their smoking history, but in a situation where they're truly, uh, um, um, in a situation where they never use tobacco, I think it's, 
important to screen them, as uh, Sienna mentioned, to see whether or not there are other biological variables contributing to the development of small cell. Yeah, and so rare scenario, but one to be aware of. Um, I've had a case, I've heard of others in patients that did end up having an actionable genomic alteration that did respond to targeted therapy. And I think it just raises the overall question of thinking about each patient individually. When there's someone you see where it's like, this doesn't quite fit the, the clinical scenario is then thinking, okay, what else could possibly be going on? Uh, and this is one that I think you just have to re remember. And there's actually an ongoing phase one study investigating the combination of carboplatin etoposide with osimertinib in cases of patients with EGFR transformation that have been identified to have RB1 loss. Um, so that would be, I think, something that could be interesting. Yeah. Now, as far as, uh, so, you know, first-line immunotherapy, I think at this point, this is such an established standard of care. Frankly, it's hard to come up with questions about, about that, other than, uh, which is why we incorporated a bit more about the trilocyclib, and, and for time purposes, maybe I'll just focus on one question around that, uh, and then we'll move along. Um, I'll say, uh, so trilocyclib, is this something you're utilizing? Is this not something I have utilized a lot of? Uh, in patients with anemia, thrombocytopenia, that's been the more compelling reason for me, as opposed to neutropenia as a primary reason. Um, what are your thoughts? Is this something you're using? I think the polling actually sort of reflected what most of us are doing, which is we know the drug is there, but we don't routinely use it for majority of our patients. But I think in a situation like the patient presented, that could be the, you know, the rare occasion where I might actually think of using it, where you already see a patient with significant uh, hematologic deficit before you even introduce cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, perhaps part of the challenge is how to incorporate into our regular uh, clinic flow because a lot of our builds don't include uh, trilocyclib as part of our uh, supportive uh, regimen. Yeah, I do think that for that patient, for example, a few things that I would, would have considered, you know, assuming renal hepatic functions are adequate, which we'll assume that for our patient, would be that perhaps I would be in favor more of cisplatin. The patient did have good performance status. I think cisplatin is less myelosuppressive than the platinum with carboplatin, so I probably would have chosen cisplatin. And in the Caspian study, they did allow cisplatin or carboplatin in combination with dervalumab. You know, another thing to consider is certainly adding trilocyclib. Um, and I think I've mainly favored using trilocyclib for patients where I have significant concern up front of myelosuppression. For example, patients with limited stage where I kind of knew what um, their accounts did with the initial uh, experience with the platinum with chemotherapy and radiation, now we're doing it again in the re-challenge setting. That might be somebody that I would also strongly consider using it. So I, we have some very good questions here. So let's ask some of these and I'll make sure we, we catch up. But um, a couple that maybe I'll just quick answer is, is one, is there are, patients that, are there patients where you'd consider six cycles of platinum doublet along with IO? I do not. Categorically, I'll give up to four cycles. Um, I, I do not give more than that, I imagine, uh, if, if there's a case. Okay. Um, a question about when we can expect IO data in the limited stage setting, and I think we're all really looking forward to this, um, and I would expect that fairly soon. I mean, I don't know how soon, but um, uh, the, these have accrued. Um, another question, and this is a good one. So patient progresses from initial treatment, now presents with brain mets. So let's say it's a patient that's on uh, immunotherapy, so on either Derva or Atezo after having completed. Let's say you're three, four months in, and you get brain-only Let's say you get a solitary brain met. What would be your management in that case? The patient is asymptomatic? Asymptomatic, solitary brain met. You're seeing that the patient did not get PCI and is on Q3-month MRI brain monitoring and has a solitary brain met show up. So uh, I think in a patient like that, depending on whether or not you gave them PCI before, if they did not get PCI, of course, now you have the option of, number one, you have to treat the brain met. Uh, the second is what do you do with the systemic therapy? I, in situations like that, when it's isolated brain progression, I would treat the brain met and continue with the systemic therapy because the biology is probably different and your systemic therapy is potentially still helping to control the extracranial disease. The question becomes, how do you treat the brain met? I think 
Uh, a lot of us these days are very comfortable with SRS uh, for uh, isolated, even maybe two or three uh, lesions in the brain to treat with SRS, as long as we are sure that the patient can follow regular MRI monitoring in case of further progression to pick it early. Um, I struggle at this point to really recommend whole brain radiation to patients unless they have multiple uh, brain metastases. So I, I'm sort of concerned that they will not follow up with regular monitoring. Yeah, I agree. I think increasingly, um, I think we're looking forward to seeing more of the definitive studies demonstrating, you know, the efficacy of SRS. But I think the early data that we have really is showing excellent tolerability, and certainly there is shorter time to CNS progression when you use SRS versus whole brain, which isn't surprising. But in the early studies, the overall survival is similar between these groups. So I think for a patient that you can monitor and that you have good follow-up with, I certainly would um, strongly consider SRS instead of whole brain, I agree. Yeah, and I think the point I was getting at as well is just treating the brain but not counting this as systemic progression, meaning that the immunotherapy may still be very effective, and I think it's important to then continue those patients. And I know I'm stating that somewhat uh, strongly because I have a few patients who I've treated recurrent brain mats, and in some cases it was three times where that patient had recurrent brain mats, but no other systemic progression. And actually that patient uh, is now many years into having gotten that treatment and has not had progression since. I mean, she may be one of these one one of these super responders. I think there may be patients who are getting immunotherapy now. That I know we say that this is not curable, but I, I expect that when we get to the 10-year time point, there will be patients that never end up getting another line of therapy. I don't think that's going to be a lot. I think that's going to be a small subset of the patients. But it is. I mean, this is this is huge for those individuals, and, and so I think it would be doing a disservice to switch over to something else. Um, that patient I mentioned actually is not on systemic therapy any further. Uh, this, uh, this really has been years. So um, re-challenging, this is platinum doublet versus topo -tican. This was a three-month chemotherapy for interval, so a little different than the U.S. standard of six months, which, which has been longer standing. We see an improve or, or separation of the curves and progression-free survival, but really no difference in overall survival with the retreatment of platinum atoposide. Uh, my, my perspective is um, that although this is really the recommended guidelines on NCCN uh, for those with a six-month chemotherapy-free interval, I think some of that is long-standing and goes back to when there really weren't a lot of other treatment options. And so let's get into some of, some of what those are. Uh, Topotecan is uh, an FDA-approved option. This is the longest-standing one based upon those curves on the right side. Uh, and sorry, that says best supportive care on the right side, that should be versus CAV. This was topotecan versus CAV. There was no real separation in the curves, but it was a bit better tolerated and did lead to FDA approval. The, that's the IV form of topotecan. On the left is PO topotecan, and this was versus best supportive care. And to my knowledge, this is the only positive randomized trial in second line and beyond small cell lung cancer. So although we consistently talk about how low the bar is, um, this is on a high-gravity planet because it's really hard to jump over that very low bar. Uh, but, but in this case, versus best supportive care. Now, I think this is important also. You know, I don't mean to make light of either of versus best supportive care showing benefit. This is to show that cytotoxics actually are doing something. Yes, there are toxicities, but, but outcomes actually are better. And this was in patients with uh, a worse performance status, which is part of why it was versus best supportive care. So our treatments are doing something. Um, they're not doing a ton, and, and it's hard to do more, but this is where what we'll discuss. Now, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to skip through some of this. I think people are familiar with some of the topo -tican toxicities. I find this is, this is a difficult treatment to give, and um, I'll admit I often end up using a rinotecan rather than topo -tican, but we'll discuss that. Uh, Lurbanectin, a more recently FDA-approved uh, second-line treatment option. This is... Um, has uh, an impact on transcription as well as within the tumor microenvironment. Uh, Tumor-associated macrophages have inflammatory, release inflammatory markers as well as stimulate VEGF, so vascularization of the tumor, and lurbanexidin also results in apoptosis of those tumor-associated macrophages, therefore uh, less release of these inflammatory markers in VEGF. And that's uh, a part of the mechanism. Now, the progression-free survival on this um, is not, this, this does not tell us that the work is done. Uh, clearly, this is why clinical trials continue to be a preferred uh, treatment, but it does represent an advance, and I'm going to go through some of that. Now, the, um, 
Uh, median progression-free survival of 3.5 months, as I said, is not the home run we all want. Um, it did separate out based upon chemotherapy-free interval of less than 90 days or more than 90 days. And the prior trials with topo -TCAN restricted enrollment to those trials to those with more than 60 or 45 days of chemotherapy-free interval. This enrolled everybody. Now, we do see real differences in these, and it's not in the medians. Uh, much like in the first-line studies, the advances of, a, uh, of the immunotherapies is not in the medians, but in the tails. Now, cytotoxics are a bit different um, in, in that it's not as small a subset that gets that extraordinary benefit, and, and the tail of the curves is not the same as the immunotherapy curves either, but to say that I think the story is more complex in both cases. Chemotherapy for interval less than 90 days, you see in the middle there, this is, these are the patients that are really the most resistant, these are the most terrible uh, of the small cells, uh, median progression-free survival about two and a half months, but about 19% of those with six-month uh, with six-month progression, uh, uh, free of progression, which is to say that in the second line, they're having longer disease control than they did in the first line for 19% of patients. It's meaningful for that subset. In the greater than 90-day chemotherapy-free interval, we see 44% of patients with a six-month chemotherapy-free interval. Now, all of this comes from 105 patients enrolled on a basket trial, so this also uh, to acknowledge that this is limited numbers. But I think we see some subsets there with um, what I would call durable, and I put that in quotation marks within the setting of small cell, that certainly represents, re represents durable, within this setting uh, for each of those. Um, here is uh, more data or more images related to some of that. I think for the sake of time, I'll kind of go past that. Now, as far as side effect profile, 46% of patients had grade three or four neutropenia, about 5% with febrile neutropenia. These patients were not allowed primary prophylaxis, and so I would expect that number to be lower in those uh, treated with prophylactic GCSF. Um, and in patients that I have where I am treating them with this, if I am concerned about them being more frail or concerned about uh, the possible development of an infection or febrile neutropenia, then I will use it. I do not use GCSF in all patients. But one other to highlight is the fatigue. Now, when I first saw this data, I thought 7% of patients, we're talking about second line and beyond small cell lung cancer, with, um, uh, with fatigue, you know, that can be related to disease. Uh, but that being said, I'm pretty convinced now that this really does happen for some patients due to uh, lurbanectidin. Uh, and the most extreme case I have is a patient who had extremely rapidly progressive disease, even for small cell it was very aggressive, that when he got lurbanectidin had a beautiful radiographic response, uh, but had crushing fatigue after a few doses to the point where I could not give him any more treatment. Uh, he had ongoing radiographic stable disease for another four months off the drug before he again had very rapidly progressive disease and unfortunately, the, the next two lines that I tried to give him did not, did not work for him. So it, it did control the disease, but he had a lot of fatigue. For me, in my experience, that 7% seems pretty realistic, um, but, but most patients, thankfully, do not have, uh, ha have that. Now, to acknowledge, there was also a randomized trial, lurbanectidin plus doxorubicin versus topo or CAV, and uh, this study was negative, um, and you can see the curves uh, I can't, <laughs> you know, the curves are on top of each other enough that I'm looking on the right there and I'm not sure if that's representing one arm or both arms, but they were really overlapping. Um, and, uh, and this has not moved forward. I think what we can say from this is, um, so the combination of lurbanectidin plus doxorubicin certainly did not have the synergy that we would hope for and therefore is not being further pursued. The dosing of lurbanectidin was a bit lower um, and so this is part of why I really try to not dose reduce if possible. If I have someone who comes in who has neutropenia, for example, and they did not get GCSF, then I, then I may utilize that as a way of not dose reducing. Um, all right, so beyond second line options, I'm going to be very quick for the sake of time. This is the NCCN guidelines. And you can see that for prefer, preferred regimens, it says platinum doublet uh, retreatment, and that's in the setting of a chemotherapy-free interval greater than six months. Uh, or clinical trial, further highlighting our need for ongoing drug development uh, and, and the need for progress in the space. There's a list of other recommended topics, and there are quite a few there, and I'll maybe highlight a few that, that I think are more clinically relevant, at least in my practice. 
Um, maybe I'll just say right here, because I don't think I have it in here, is pembrolizumab and nivolumab are on there, and that is just in patients not previously treated with a checkpoint inhibitor. So can. when we're looking at these, I mean, these are older studies. This is 1992. So 15 patients, five of them limited stage, 10 of extensive stage. Uh, we see 47% partial response. Um, now, can. I think many have a lot of experience utilizing. This is a drug, as I said, that I would typically use rather than topotecan, uh, and I often do use this in third line. Paclitaxel, uh, for the sake of time, I'll just skip ahead and say that the weekly dosing um, I find to be very well tolerated, and especially in the setting where you're talking about third, fourth line small cell lung cancer, um, the uh, no toxicity or limited toxicity becomes really important in that because the likelihood of getting durable responses I think goes down as we get further along into the treatment. I find weekly dosing to, to be very well tolerated. Temozolomide, I think, is, is particularly important in patients with brain progression that have previously gotten radiation. So someone who has uh, an intracranial disease um, that does not have radiation as a treatment option, I will then consider temozolomide given the good CNS penetration. So returning to the case, uh, patient was, um, let's see, we, oh, so this patient had, had um, gotten all their first line and now talking about second line therapy. Um, so to answer a couple of questions on here, um, as far as, uh, so for brain mets, uh, I mean, the treatment in my mind is radiation if feasible. That is far and away the better way of treating brain mets. Um, there was a question, uh, can trilacyclib be used with lurbinectidin? It's not approved for the use with lurbinectidin. That would be an off-label use. Uh, so that's one that I, I guess one could consider, but it is an off-label uh, uh, use of that drug. And, and uh, to go back, there was a question about next generation sequencing or testing, how to commu communicate with um, community oncologists about that. I mean, it is within the NCCN guidelines, actually, that in a patient without a smoking history, that doing genomic testing uh, is, uh, is an indication. Um, I, I know, Dr. Wanikoko, I, I have certainly cut into your time, so let's um, continue on. Patient was treated on Lerby in the second line and now later has progression, and so let's focus on some of the, the work, ongoing work in the field. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think this really reflects uh, where we all live these days. You know, after one or two lines of treatment, our patients are in need of uh, something different than usual. And uh, I think the field has made some progress in the last three to five years, uh, thanks to some of the support from the NCI, where we now recognize that there are specific transcriptional uh, defined subtypes of small cell that may have implication for how we treat this patient going forward. Uh, three of these transcription factors have been well established are lineage defining transcription factors. Um, the inflamed subtype is not transcriptionally defined. It's more of absence of any of the transcription factors is going to be an enrichment factor for patients whose tumors will uh, be uh, immune infiltrated. And um, this was actually where this started from, looking at cell line data and some tissue samples, uh, where four original transcription factors were defined. Now we have ATO1 as additional transcription factor. I think the top three are the best characterized. They're known to be lineage defining. YAP1 may not be uh, a lineage defining transcription factor, but I think it does have value as a way to identify patients either for clinical trial enrollment or for prognostication and uh, potentially uh, research uh, strategy going forward. So some of the uh, efforts in this space looking at these transcriptional factors as potential predictive biomarkers have been tested in the post hoc setting. We currently do not have any prospective trial that evaluated whether or not these are actually predictive of any therapy. But in uh, the review and reanalysis of the uh, data from the uh, Empower 133 trial, where tissue samples were characterized. This is work out of RM Bias's group. Uh, they looked at patients treated with chemotherapy or those treated with chemotherapy and IO based on these four different subtypes the three well defined lineage defining transcription factors, AN and P, and the triple negative or inflamed subtype. And what this data showed is when you look at 
patients who are long-term survivors. Really, you see enrichment for those patients in the inflamed subtype when they receive atezolizumab and uh, chemotherapy, suggesting that this could be a way to enrich for patients who will benefit from the strategy of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. I must warn, this is retrospective study, so we need prospective clinical validation or at least well-planned uh, post hoc analysis of ongoing trials to really help uh, uh, test this hypothesis rigorously. Uh, this is Caspian data looking at similar uh, analysis by the, uh, both the classic transcriptional factor description of A, N, P, and Y, uh, also showing that there is biomarker by transcription factor interaction in patients treated with dovalumab and uh, chemotherapy, but you don't see that separation of the curve when they only got chemotherapy. What is actually intriguing here is YAP1, which I just told you is not a well <coughs> accepted uh, lineage defining transcription factor, did just as well as using the inflamed phenotyping. Uh, so the median overall survival for those patients was 17.3 months uh, when treated with dovalumab and chemotherapy. And you see the inflamed signature also came out with 17.6 months median overall survival. Uh, for those patients treated with uh, chemoimmunotherapy. There was no separation of the curve for those treated with chemotherapy alone. Uh, this is uh, similar data just looking at uh, long-term survival uh, by treatment, as well as just looking at the level of uh, inflammation, whether it's high or low. Uh, again, replicating the data that I just showed you that when you have the inflamed signature being in the top quartile, those patients did better when treated with chemoimmunotherapy, but there was no difference when treated with chemotherapy alone. Uh, switching gears, we've now established anti-PDL1 plus chemotherapy as standard. The question is, how can we make that better? So this is an ongoing phase two randomized study that is targeting the NK cell compartment uh, with BMS 986012, uh, building on the backbone of chemo plus nivolumab uh, Dr. Tiziana Lee led the ECOG trial that showed that this regimen is better than chemotherapy alone, so I think it's a reasonable platform to add additional uh, agents onto. And uh, this is meant to work through different mechanisms, including antibody drug, uh, uh, antibody dependent uh, complement uh, mediated cytotoxicity, as well as reactivating the uh, T cell within the tumor immune microenvironment. In the single arm phase one trial, the compound looked really, really interesting when combined with uh, nivolumab alone. So it's reasonable to expect that this regimen hopefully will also turn out to be something that will improve the overall outcome for patients. Uh, the other strategy is looking at those patients who have completed induction chemotherapy and now in this uh, maintenance phase. Is there anything unique about this patient that we could build upon? And this is what the SWOG 1929 trial was trying to test to see whether or not the addition of PARP inhibitor to immunotherapy during the maintenance phase will result in better outcome for patients. So this required patients too much to be Schlafen 11 positive, which had been shown to be a somewhat predictive of activity for a PARP inhibitor. This study is fully enrolled. Uh, we are waiting for the... Um, um, uh, the outcome of the study. Hopefully, this will become a positive trial. And uh, whether or not we're going to need a larger randomized trial to actually convince ourselves that this is a realistic strategy, I think will depend on how positive the, the result is. And then we've heard a lot about um, lobinectidine uh, during this session. Uh, while the drug is quite promising. We know that it does not have full FDA approval yet and actually does not have any other regulatory approval that I'm aware of. So there are strategies ongoing to see what else can be done to make uh, lobinectidine effect even more durable and more impactful. So the LUPA study is looking at the combination of lobinectidine with pembrolizumab and I must say this study actually started uh, before the uh, Atlantis trial read out. And this is really trying to see whether or not adding pembrolizumab to lobinectidine will result in better outcome for patients. Uh, this is some of the uh, early safety data showing that adding pembrolizumab to lobinectidine did not worsen any of the known toxicity, especially hematologic toxicity. But I want to point out that a significant uh, proportion of patients, about 77% of patients with fatigue, 
nonetheless, majority of those were uh, less than grade three fatigue. Uh, only 7.7% of patients had grade three and there were no grade four fatigue uh, reported. But nonetheless, grade two fatigue could be uh, disabling for the patient. That, just something to keep in mind if this regimen were to move forward uh, to become standard of care for patients. The Lagoon trial is also comparing uh, lobinectidine uh, monotherapy or lobinectidine with arenotecan uh, to investigators' choice of uh, um, topotecan or arenotecan. This is building on the single arm trial that looked at lobinectidine and arenotecan and showed really, really impressive overall response rate. And uh, the goal is to see whether or not this regimen can actually be well tolerated long enough uh, to impact patient overall survival. So we'll wait for the outcome of this uh, trial. Uh, there are other strategies combining lobinectidine with atezolizumab uh, in the maintenance setting. Uh, I think all of these strategies are reasonable, but one thing to point out is we actually do not have any real preclinical data to support any of these strategies. This is more of just simplistic addition of one agent to another and hoping that something uh, better will come out of it. So what this really tells me is we need to have better strategy to incorporate biomarker development into this effort to bring new strategy and new uh, regimen into the, into the field. Uh, there are other studies now that are currently underway. Uh, NRGLU007 is looking at adding radiation, thoracic radiation to site of metastatic disease during the maintenance phase of uh, chemoimmunotherapy for extensive stage disease. And uh, as you see here, four different trials have now fully enrolled in the limited stage setting, Adriatic, NRGLU005, uh, M the Keylink 013, they are all uh, trying to answer the question of what exactly does immunotherapy bring into the limited stage setting. Uh, PAP inhibitor combinations have been well tested preclinically as well as in the clinic. Uh, we know from the work done by Dr. Anna Farago when she was still at MGH that adding uh, olaparib to temozolomide improved response rate and also led to improved progression-free survival. This is a similar study, but asking a different question. Preclinically, using low-dose temozolomide along with talazoparib actually enhanced the efficacy of talazoparib. So this is actually the design of this trial, trying to use low-dose intermittent dosing schedule of temozolomide to improve on the efficacy of talazoparib. And uh, with overall response rate of almost 40% and PFS of 4.5 months, an impressive OS of 11.9 months, this appears to be uh, a very good strategy that is worth exploring further, especially if we can further bring biomarker enrichment strategy uh, into, the, into this space. And what are some of the uh, biomarkers that one could consider in a situation where we are trying to use PARP inhibitors? Uh, Schlafen 11, I already mentioned, this actually came out of a phase two trial that looked at the addition of telmozolamide and um, uh, um, um, a PAP inhibitor Veliparib, uh, where we uh, observe that patients who benefited from the combination of Veliparib and, temozol and temozolomide were those with Schlafen expressing tumor. Our preclinical work was later done to show that Schlafen expression is actually a predictor of benefit from PAP inhibitor. And this is the background to the S1929 trial. And I believe that this could also help uh, in a prospective manner in the relapse setting. Uh, liposomal irinotecan, I think, had some promise. Uh, everybody thought that given the fact that naked irinotecan had some activity and liposomal irinotecan appeared better in preclinical modeling as well as in pancreatic cancer patients, uh, perhaps that this would be a better strategy to go up head-to-head uh, -head against topotecan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the resilient trial uh, failed to demonstrate improved overall survival in patients treated with liposomal irinotecan. There was increased uh, rate of uh, objective responses, but whether or not this is really what is going to drive uh, patient benefit remains to be seen when there was no overall survival advantage. And so this uh, strategy, I think at this point, uh, it becomes really, really challenging to find a way forward with in the absence of any uh, enrichment strategy. Uh, in the last five minutes, I want to just talk about some of the more uh, interesting strategy looking at 
different ways of uh, engaging the immune system, uh, the bite and the car construct are now ways by which we're trying to bring immunotherapy into the relapse setting and ultimately into the frontline setting. So the bispecific T cell engaging antibodies try to identify specific markers on the surface of the uh, tumor cells, in this case, DLL3, and then they also link with uh, CD3 on the surface of the T cell and bring both the immune cells and the tumor cells into close proximity, leading to activation of the immune cells and uh, tumor cell uh, kill. So talatumab is the best developer of this agent, but it's not the only agent in this space. Uh, at least now there's about four different uh, bispecific T cell engaging antibody, including tri-specific uh, uh, antibody being developed. Uh, but the result of tolatumab in relapsed small cell uh, appeared very, very promising with overall response rate of 23%. But more importantly, we've seen different data today about relapse disease and salvage therapy option. Nothing that we've seen so far showed us median overall survival of 13.2 months in the relapse uh, stage. And these are patients, this is not second line, this is actually second line and beyond. So some of these patients had had three or four lines of treatment before they went on trial. I think what this signal is telling us is if we can find patients who will benefit from this strategy, if they respond, the response tends to be durable and is translating into overall survival advantage for patients. Of course, there is the CRS concern. Uh, fortunately, to date, this has been generally uh, easy to manage and uh, low grade, grade one and reversible for the most part. So this is the Delphi 301, which is now building on the initial uh, first in human study. Uh, this would be the dose optimization uh, phase uh, that would now lead to the definitive trial. And uh, this is going to be enrolling patients into a low dose and the high dose tolatumab um, so this study is uh, currently now uh, enrolling in different parts of the country. Uh, these are other investigational DLL3 T cell engagers and CAR T constructs, uh, either in development or some of them have been tested and perhaps maybe will not be moving forward. And then finally, antibody drug conjugate. Uh, I think Every one of us is uh, really hopeful that this will be something that will be helpful and uh, effective in patients with small cell. At the ESMO meeting last year, we got this data that was presented by the Daiichi group uh, showing their novel compound that is targeting B7H3 uh, as an antibody drug conjugate with uh, Derexacan as the payload. Uh, this was a basket trial that enrolled multiple different uh, tumor histologies, but small cell was, was one of the subset. Why this is relatively small subset of patients? Uh, the signal there is really, really promising with response rates uh, being seen in 11 out of 19 patients. And these were confirmed in 10 of those 11 patients at the time of uh, data presentation. And as you can see from that spider plot, majority of patients treated with this compound actually had some degree of uh, too much shrinkage. Of course, not all of them met uh, objective response criteria to be called uh, responders. But nonetheless, uh, this looked like a very, very promising strategy that is worth testing in this patient population. And uh, I think that will be my last slide, and I'll be happy to take questions and comments. Thank yeah, you. This is great. And this is an excellent review of, uh, of all that's going on, and there's so much going on. Um, so some questions then uh, that came through. Um, so one interesting one, a bit different. So the small cell transformation following progression on osimertinib. So EGFR mutant positive non-small cell lung cancer now progressing as uh, um, small cell lung cancer. And the question was, would you treat this differently? Now, I'll point out, I think that a lot of the treatment for this ends up not really, these patients don't get included in a lot of our small cell trials, but the fact that it's small cell ends up driving a lot of the treatment. Um, so, Dr. Leo, any, anything you want to highlight for this population? I mean, how, what's your kind of general path of treatment? Yeah, for patients with um, EGFR, non-small cell lung cancer who developed transformation. We have three publications now showing in different parts of the world. There's a European study, an American study, um, 
and also an Asian study demonstrating that the post-transformation course, the average survival is about 10 months, and it's pretty consistent across these retrospective studies. And certainly the way to manage these patients in most of these studies um, that were described included a platinum etoposide. They also responded to taxanes, but the responses were short-lived. In the American study, which was a study that included multiple um, different institutions around the country, like MGH and um, Stanford, they described the monotherapy experience in that patient population. It was essentially you know, ineffective as monotherapy. So I think these patients with EGFR transformation the EGFR kind of, lo you lose the drive for the EGFR. These patients genomically are very unstable. They all have RB1 loss and P53. And we really treat them more like small cell lung cancer with a platinum etoposide, plus minus, should you add atezolizumab or should you add continual simertinib? I think that's a question for a clinical trial that um, currently I'm not aware of that actually being done. But we've thought about it through cog Akron because it is a really important question to better understand genomically how to treat these patients. And then importantly, is there a path forward in terms of clinical trials of trying to predict who's going to develop EGFR transformation? We know that patients with EGFR who have RB1 loss are higher risk. Can you change the biology of the disease? Because it is a terminal event for the EGFR patient. It really changes the biology of their disease quite significantly. Well, one of the most common questions I get is essentially patients asking how things are going to go. How long is it going to be controlled? How, lo how long do I have? And these types of things. And uh, although I don't want anyone to end up in a position where they're seeing me in clinic and asking these questions, uh, one thing I highlight is that any data we have is looking back. I don't quote medians. I tend to talk about ranges. But I also talk about how looking forward is how things are going to go. And we do have a lot in development. There are some new drugs that, that, are, that we've discussed. Uh, now, the medians aren't all amazing. But we do have some tails, and we do have some individuals that are really getting durable responses. And as we put these treatments together, along with some of the ones that uh, uh, Dr. Wanikoko highlighted, Looking forward, I'm optimistic that in the next five years, this will be an evolving discussion about what there is and, and what's happening for these patients. I want to thank you all for attending. Thank you, Dr. Leal and Dr. Iwanikoko for joining me as well, and have a wonderful time. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.